and welcome. My name's Crystal Evans, and as we begin our evening tonight, uh, I acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we gather this evening. We are on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future. The most ancient continuous civilization on earth, um, which I think is fitting given our topic tonight is about uh, what it means to be human. Welcome to this Wheeler Centre event, uh, an evening with AC Grayling on the origins and future of humanism. Tonight is part lecture, part conversation, part discussion. Um, it is with great pleasure that I welcome tonight's guest. Professor Anthony Grayling is the founder and master of the New College of Humanities in London and a professor of philosophy. He's written and edited over 30 books. I don't think I've read all of them, uh, but those include Liberty in the Age of Terror, The Good Book, Ideas That Matter, and The Age of Genius, uh, the 17th century. And um, we are very grateful and um, pleased to have him with us today. Uh, Professor Grayling is a frequent and popular contributor to many forms of media. He's written for The Guardian, The Times, The Observer, The Economist, and New Statesman as well as regular appearances on radio and television. He champions the active role of philosophy in all aspects of our society and regularly contributes to discussions on ethics, history, politics, science and the arts. I am thrilled that he's also a regular visitor to our shores here in Australia. So please join me in welcoming Professor Grayling to speak with us this evening on the origins and future of humanism. Well, thank you very, very much indeed. You will, of course, be familiar with the fact that uh, by the term humanism in our contemporary world, we mean a non-religious ethical outlook. And in order to explain as clearly as one might the content of that outlook, one needs to be reminded of a couple of things. And one of them is that ethics, when we talk about an ethical outlook, is not quite the same thing as morality. You can tell that by looking at the etymologies of these terms, and I know you were thumbing your way through your Latin and Greek uh, grammars last night in the bath, so you will remember that the word ethics comes from the word ethos in ancient Greek, which means character. And this is why the great ethical debate in our civilization has arisen from a period in the history of our civilization uh, when, in classical antiquity, people began to consider the question of what sort of people we are to be, how we are to live, what kinds of choices we are to make, what values should shape and color our lives, our goals and ambitions. The word morality is of much later coining. In fact, it was uh, the, the uh, origins of it come from an attempt by Cicero that uh, great Republican figure in Rome who uh, was a key figure in introducing to the Roman world some of the nuances of Greek philosophy. And he used a, a Latin term, mos mores, which means customs, etiquette, uh, good practice, to try to capture the idea that he thought he saw in the Greek debate. But as these terms have evolved through the history of ideas, morality has come to mean something rather narrower, more specialized in a way than ethics. It's about our obligations to one another, about keeping faith, about keeping promises, about our obligations to treat others according to the way that our uh, communities have negotiated the boundaries and barriers of interpersonal relations. And if you look back across the landscape of history in any society, you notice that moral outlooks change backwards and forwards over time from the more to the less puritanical. So think of the 17th century. In the middle of that century, the Puritans in England managed to close down the theaters of London. Imagine that, a mere few decades after the plays of Shakespeare and Ben Jonson and Beaumont and Fletcher had been performed on those stages. And yet, just a few decades later, in the Restoration period, Charles II returned to the throne, there was a riotous, libidinous outburst of extremely rude theatre on those same stages. 
The 18th century was fairly sensible. The 19th century, you remember, was very moralistic. It's alleged that our Victorian forebears used to hide the legs of grand pianos on the grounds that legs were obscene. After the First World War in the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, there was a, a great loosening of, of behavior and liberalization of attitudes. Immediately after the Second World War, there was a bit of a puritanical clampdown. <laughs> Tragically, Alan Turing, for example, was uh, forced, really, in the end, to commit suicide. So harassed was he by the attitude in the early 1950s towards gay people. The 1960s saw a rather wonderful liberalizing moment uh, in our recent history. Um, despite the fact that people say, if you remember it, you weren't there, uh, I do remember it, and I was there, and as you see, I still have the hairstyle, and I can tell you it was a very pleasant time. We now live in a period where we seem to be returning, alas, to something a bit more puritanical, when the moralists fill our newspaper pages with uh, complaints about um, the behavior of politicians and senior clergy and the like. Some of you in this room may remember Mrs. Mary Whitehouse. You remember her? The only person in the universe who had a television set without an off button. So she was forced to watch all that nine, nudity after nine o'clock at night and to write irritated letters to the BBC about it. And she really encapsulates what a moralist is. A moralist is somebody who says, I don't like it, therefore you mustn't see it. I don't like it, therefore you are not allowed to do it. The Morris is somebody who wants to impose their anxieties and timidities and limitations on other people. Somebody should have said to her, Mrs. Whitehouse, just switch off your television and go to bed. And then she wouldn't have harassed everybody with her views. So that's morality, and morality can sometimes in its puritanical moments be rather repressive. But that's not ethics. Ethics is about how we live. It's about an attempt to answer that question I mentioned earlier. What sort of person should I be? And that was a question that was famously asked by Socrates of his contemporaries in the, uh, in the Athenian world of his day. Now, Socrates lived at a very, very interesting moment in history. It's sometimes called the axial age, the age when questions of value really came to the fore. You may know that Socrates was born 10 years after the deaths of two other great figures in that period of history. One of them, Confucius, or in Mandarin, Gongzi, and the other, Prince Gautama Siddhartha, who we call the Buddha now. Both died in the same year, 10 years before Socrates. And the three of them uh, are rather key figures in a moment in the history of not just our own civilization, but of civilizations in general. I want you to notice something rather special about all three of those uh, thinkers. They were all philosophers. They were not religious figures. The Buddha used to say to his disciples, don't make me a god and don't turn this into a religion. But of course, you've all seen the life of Brian, the shoe, the shoe. You know what happens with anybody who has a great influence on disciples and followers. Even Plato, by the way, was thought to have been born of a virgin and was regarded as semi-divine the son of a god, for several centuries after his lifetime. So that temptation in human nature to, you know, to apotheosis, to turn great figures or thinkers uh, into deities or the sons of deities, is a very tempting one. Always sons, by the way, you notice. Anyway, these three thinkers, all philosophers, all uh, founders of philosophical outlooks, lived at this very interesting moment in the history of our species. You see, prior to that time, what people thought of as virtue, that is, as the, the thing that made somebody honorable and noble and to be looked up at in society, had a very great deal to do, firstly, with masculinity, and secondly, with the warrior capacities of masculinity. This fact is captured even in the word virtue itself. Because if you think about the first syllable of that word, ver, V-I-R, it is the Latin word for man in the masculine sense. Ver, or as my old Latin master used to say, weir, but he was a bit weird. But anyway, it means the masculine. And the idea of virtue 
all you have to do is just open your copy of the Iliad anywhere and look at Homer's uh, depiction of what a virtuous individual was in the pre-axial age. Virtue was courage, fortitude, endurance, preparedness to fight and die for your tribe or your city. That's what virtue was, the warrior virtues. But at the time of Confucius and uh, Gautama and Socrates, there was this great shift of attention away from thinking about the warrior virtues to thinking about the civic virtues, the virtues of cooperation and mutuality, of living together, of thinking about our responsibilities to one another, of thinking about how we might construct a society in which individual lives might be good and flourishing. And it was therefore at that moment that all three of those thinkers gave attention to that question how should we act? How should we live? What should we be? What do we owe to one another in our mutualities in society? And that is why I think that humanism, as we understand it today, a non-religious ethical outlook, could be traced right back to the beginning of thought about the ethical in that sense, right back to the axial age. And my reason for thinking that I'll explain just in a moment. You will be familiar, however, with the fact that the word humanism has been used in a variety of different senses. And one major uh, way that it's been used is to denote those uh, figures, scholars and writers um, and thinkers who lived in the Renaissance period, the 14th and 15th and 16th centuries in European history. Take a figure like Erasmus, for example, tremendously famous in his own day, much admired across Europe, a man of very moderate outlook, a man who, although he lived at the time of the Protestant Reformation and of the great quarrels, therefore, that arose um, between different denominations of Christianity, uh, remained a Catholic, but a very moderate one, and didn't take sides in that particular argument beyond uh, staying where he was, so to speak, in the, uh, in the church. But he was a humanist because, like many others of his time, poets, historians, writers, essayists, artists, he found that the rediscovered outlook of the ancient world, rediscovered through the texts of antiquity, which were being uh, found again, dug out of old libraries, printed, new printing press, of course, had come into existence towards the end of the 15th century and had made a huge impact on the mind of Europe because after Gutenberg, within a matter of decades, almost every town and city had its printing press and literally tens of thousands of books were being published and these books were mainly works uh, edited from, from antiquity. So you can, you can look at a contrast, the contrast between how art and literature was in the high medieval period and how it was in the Renaissance period when Renaissance humanism flourished. In the medieval period, most art was devotional art. Crucifixions, depositions, annunciations, flagellations, anything to do with the, the story of religion. And quite often that art was very coercive. Next time you're in Munich, Go to the Alta Pinacothek in Munich, which has the world's greatest collection of medieval altarpieces and murals, and you will be shocked. I mean, nowadays, our newspapers and television censor uh, scenes from places of war and conflict, but those murals with their depictions of suffering of the souls of the damned in hell, designed, of course, to frighten people into obedience to their priests, are very, very coercive give an utterly different picture of uh, what the faith was in those days, such that if somebody were um, resurrected from that period and planted into one of our contemporary churches where everybody's smiling and shaking hands and so on, you'd be absolutely astonished. And that, that, that art, therefore, was mainly devotional art. It was about how we endure this life in the veil of tears, how we can just get through without sinning too much so that when we die, perhaps, we won't spend too long in purgatory and can get into heaven at last. But in the Renaissance, with the discovery of the classical outlook on the world, a celebration of life in the here and now, life between cradle and grave, things to celebrate in the natural world around us, is reflected in the art and the poetry and the literature of the time. Think of the paintings of the Renaissance, landscapes and nudes and depictions of picnics in the countryside, portraits of ordinary people. 
Think of the poetry. Think of the expanded outlook in philosophy and pretty soon in science on the world. A rediscovery of the value of things of this life. That rediscovery was a rediscovery of the outlook of classical antiquity. And so when we think of the Renaissance humanists and when we mean by the word humanist in that context an interest in things human, an interest in things of this world and life, we see the beginnings of what we mean by humanism now. Because, of course, in the period between the 15th century and the 18th century Enlightenment, the humanist mindset became more and more and more secular. The more that people understood human nature and the human condition and its place in this natural world of ours and its relationship with that world, the less that people thought that we were just passengers passing through a material realm of great risk to our immortal souls, that this was sort of a kind of departure lounge that we entered at birth and left at death in order to go on to the, the real reality of life after death. And so our sense of humanism now, humanism in the contemporary non-religious sense, is the inheritor of that shift of attention back to the world that we experience around us. Uh, uh, the um, shift of attention that recovered for us the kind of thinking that was of essence in the period of classical antiquity when people like Socrates began to ask that question, how shall we live? Now Socrates' question, how shall we live, what sort of people should we be, uh, is, carries a, a very, very simple seeming answer which nevertheless is extraordinarily deep and profound. Because when Socrates challenged people, as he did all his, his contemporaries in Athens, you may remember he set himself up as a kind of gadfly, um, stinging people into thinking what they really meant by words such as the good and kindness and continence and courage and so on. He asked them this and he would show them that they hadn't really thought things through. After all, things were the same in ancient times as they are now. Remember what Bertrand Russell said on this head, he said most people would rather die than think, and most people do, which of course is the great tragedy of our world. I've discovered, by the way, a, a, another little anecdote which so beautifully illustrates the same problem, and that is, do you remember when Adlai Stevenson was standing against uh, uh, Eisenhower for the presidency of the United States back in 1952? He was a bit of a sort of Bernie Sanders character in a way, and somebody said to him, Mr. Stevenson, Every thinking person in the United States of America is going to vote for you. And he said, I'm pleased to hear it, but I need a majority. Well, that, <laughs> that was the discovery that Socrates made, that people really didn't think through these ideas that they thought governed the way they lived their lives. And he wanted them to think about it. And so he said to them, and this is the great message that he left to posterity, really. He said, when you think about it, the life really worth living, the worthwhile life, is the considered life, the life thought about, the life chosen. This is the simple seeming, simple seeming point that he made, that he wanted to make. And the deep, profound dimension of that simple seeming uh, adjuration to think, to choose, is this. If you say to people, the life that would be really worth living for you is the life that you have thought about and chosen, implies that the idea of a good and worthwhile life is a very, very individual idea. That it's not a case of there being just one answer for everybody on the planet about what a good life is. There's not a one-size-fits-all view about the nature of a good and worthwhile life. But each individual has to think for himself or herself about what he or she is, you know, some degree of self-understanding. Remember what it said over the entrance to the oracle at Delphi? Know thyself. And that kind of self-understanding would help one to look at what one's talents and capacities could lead one to do in the way of something valuable in life, and in particular, valuable in the way of good relationships with others, because we are essentially social animals. Just as the ants are, just as dogs are, just as any social animal is, we human beings are social animals. 
We need friends. We need to be members of communities. We need to love and be loved. And therefore, the question of how we live with others, how we relate to them, is an essential part of the answer to the question that we give, how should I live, what should I be? So Socrates, in saying the considered life, the chosen life, the life thought about, that idea is the, the keel, the center point, the absolute center of gravity of the humanist outlook. So in our contemporary world now, when we talk about humanism, we mean an attitude, an ethical orientation to the world. Unlike almost every other ethical theory you can think of, and certainly unlike every moral theory you can think of, humanism is not a doctrine of do's and don'ts, of prescriptions and proscriptions. There is, of course, one adjuration in uh, humanism, and that is think for yourself, take responsibility, make a choice, live a life that you've chosen, and do it responsibly. And by the way, behind that, of course, is the idea that you have to be able to make a case to yourself and to anybody else who challenges you about the choice you make. I mean, supposing, for example, you thought, okay, uh, I'm going to you know, have to consider my talents. I think I'd be a very good murderer. Well, that's not going to stand up to scrutiny. You're not going to be able to persuade anybody that the effects of living that kind of life are going to be good ones for other people unless you've got Trump in mind or something. So <laughs> you've got a, you, you, you have to, you have to actually have a set of reasons that you owe other people for the choices that you make in your life. But the idea of the chosen, the considered life, really, that's the only instruction, in a way, that humanism gives, to think for yourself and to choose your own life. But otherwise, it is not a set of do's and don'ts. It's an attitude. And the attitude in question is this. You should approach any of your fellows in the human story any of your neighbors in humanity, with generosity and sympathy. Generosity and sympathy because it's not always easy to be a human being. Any human life has falling across it the shadows of sorrow and failure and difficulty and loss and grief. Even though human life can be very full of joy and, and happiness, and even though almost all worthwhile lives are marked or characterized by endeavor, which to the person, the agent involved, seems worthwhile because there are aims and goals that, that the agent wants to achieve. Nevertheless, we have to accept the stippled effect of our emotional lives and our relations with others. Remember Ludwig Wittgenstein's sister, Hermione, said to him one day, Ludwig, you remember he was a very eccentric character, and she said to him, Ludwig, we in the family cannot understand why you behave so oddly sometimes. And he said, you're like a person looking out of a window and seeing a man walking in the street in an extremely funny way, a very odd way, maybe a bit like John Cleese's funny walks. And what you don't understand is that he's walking like that because he's struggling to make headway against the gale blowing down the street. Now, every one of us has gales blowing in the inner landscape of our lives. And when that happens, we need the friendship and the sympathy of our fellows. And sometimes when we give friendship and sympathy to our fellows too, in the act of doing so, we recognize what is good about our human bonds. So the idea of being generous and sympathetic is key to the humanistic outlook. Of course, one must have standards. There's got to be, you know, there have to be some lines in the sand somewhere. You know how they say, it's a great thing to have a, an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. Well, in just the same way, when you are being generous and sympathetic and you encounter somebody who's greedy and cruel and stupid and selfish and does harm to others, then I think it's a time to be robust and not to accept that. But one's default should be generosity and sympathy. Only imagine if the entire world was convinced of this view, the very, very simple seeming view, but again, a very deep one. Because when you encounter another human being, the acts of generosity and sympathy will be acts of efforts to understand the other, really to hear the other. You know how it is, most of the world's problems arise from not really, not really grasping why people are as they are, not really understanding what it is they're saying to one or what their actions mean. 
So attentiveness and perceptiveness, the ability to engage and to understand others, is tremendously important. And that is what humanism is about. Now, sometimes people say, when I'm talking about humanism, they say, well, what a, this focus on human beings and on human experience and on the human world, what about the animals and what about nature at large? And I say, humanism is a, a, a view of life which sees us as fully part of nature. We are fully partnered with all our fellow, fellow sentient creatures in the world, not just with other animals, but with the whole of nature itself. This is our home, the natural world. We have a responsibility for it. We have to be good neighbors to, to nature as well as to one another in the human story. And one way of thinking about this is to think of bringing other animals and indeed the natural world itself into the sphere of our ethical concern, to treat plants, trees, as well as kangaroos and, and uh, quokkas as having uh, the status of moral patients you know the contrast between the idea of agency, of the agent and the patient, the agent who does things. Remember ego, agere, egi, actum in Latin, meaning to do, to make. And the idea of patience, of being passive. In the olden days, people thought that things like anger and lust and love were passions because the gods inflicted them on us as a kind of punishment. We now think of passions as active things, but originally they weren't. Now, almost anything in the world with intrinsic value is a patient of moral action or ethical action because it can be affected by it. Take the example of a chicken. We don't think of a chicken as a moral agent. We don't say, oh, naughty chicken, when we think it's told a fib or uh, run away with somebody else's grain. But we do treat the chicken as a moral patient because it's capable of suffering and of being afraid and of enjoying life. And so how we act towards it calls on our responsibility and our sensitivity to it. So a humanist is not only focused on the well-being of humankind, on the endeavor to try to be as embracing and as encompassing as possible of all the great diversity of, of human nature, human interests and needs, but also towards the home of humanity, to the world occupied by we human beings, with our great responsibility to it, not least because we have practiced so many depredations on it over the centuries and done it so much harm and wounded it so much already that we are in danger of having so soiled our own home that it puts us at risk because of climate change and other problems resulting from pollution. So a humanist is somebody who thinks about the home of humanity and the fellowship that humanity has with the rest of, of the world. But of course the key thing is this idea of trying to be the best sort of human being that one can be, given one's own talents and capacities, one's own interests, thinking about the sorts of relationships that we can uh, forge with others, thinking how wonderful it would be if when one human being encounters another human being, whoever those two human beings are, that they first receive one another as a human being, first and foremost, and only then as a man or a woman, or then as a Frenchman or an Australian, and only then as somebody who has a particular identity, perhaps is a medical practitioner or is a philosopher or is a rugby player, these things, these other identities and other characteristics that people have and choose to have and occupy are secondary by quite a long way to the fact that first and foremost they are human beings. And so humanism focuses on this question of the intrinsic humanity of our fellows in the story as well as the home that we occupy together in our world. Sympathy and generosity. Only imagine all the great religions of the world have, alas, a, a premise tucked away um, deep in their doctrinal outlooks, which say something like this, our view is the correct one, so other people are wrong. Now well, they've got to try to convert them or zap them because they're you know, maybe a danger to us or because their view of the world is leading them astray in some way. Religions tend to be very divisive. They tend to be very self 
centered in their moral certitude about what the right way to think and to live is. But humanism, instead of being divisive, instead of saying, you're wrong, just says, you're human. And human beings have such a, a range of different endeavors and, and desires and interests. And human beings can be perfectly horrible sometimes. And yet, we have to live together as members of the same family. And it's essential, therefore, that the ethical view that we take should be one which is inclusive of all. Now, I sometimes say to my, my students, I say to them, why is it that the newspapers and the news reports on television are full of war and conflict, atrocity, harm, murder, devastation, terrorist attacks? Why does our world seem so scarred by the ugliness of inhumanity? And the answer is, because those things are news. Most of the interactions between human beings in every second of every day in every town, village, city of the world are good interactions. They're cooperative. The reason why you will never see on the front page of the age a headline which says, shopkeeper is polite to customer, is because this tends to happen a bit too often for it to be news. But that is the majority story. There is an enormous fund of material out there in the world on which humanism can grow, a really rich, fertile resource in our humanity. You know, if you were walking down the street and you saw somebody ahead of you and there's a crane with an enormous load attached to the cable and the cable is fraying and just about to snap and this great load would fall on the head of that hapless individual, what would you do? It doesn't matter who that person is, what religious insignia they're wearing, what age they are, what ethnicity, you would shout out a warning spontaneously. Spontaneously. Just as you would wince if you saw somebody having a really bad accident. You may have seen on YouTube just recently um, the filming of people's reactions to that occasion where a basketball player in America had his eye pop out. Do you remember that? There was the scene of this basketball player to a bang of heads and his eye pops out and they show you the reactions of people on YouTube all going Ooh, like that. Well, that is how we react when we see harm to others. So we do have a nature to one another. And that is the thing that humanists would love to see fostered, brought out, expanded, made the way that we treat one another when we encounter one another as our paths cross in this world. That's what humanism is. And that, I hope, is going to be the future of the world when we come to realize that all our divisions and ideologies do so much harm and that there is a better way of thinking about things which would become clear to us in all its simplicity and depth if we just opened our eyes and saw that other people are people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Grayling, for such a, um, a positive and inspiring um, message about uh, humanism. My, my first question is, why isn't it more popular? <laughs> um, is, why isn't humanism uh, something that has a greater profile or something that more people uh, willingly identify with? The, the great religions know that unless they can, they can plant a seed in the minds of small children that they don't have much chance. You know how it is. What, what happens is um, small children, for good evolutionary reasons, are very credulous. So they believe in God, the Tooth Fairy, Father Christmas. I hope this is not bad news for anybody out there, but there's no Father Christmas or Tooth Fairy, or God for that matter. Um, but um, the, the um, social reinforcement of the God part is tremendous. You know, you have temples and churches and mosques and synagogues, you know, in all our towns and cities. Men, it's always men at the top of religions, isn't it, who wear funny clothes and who are there on great public occasions. And so there's a massive reinforcement of the religion idea. And worst of all, religious studies in school. When I was a boy, it used to be called religious instruction. Now imagine that. Well, now it's called religious studies. But even so, the, the study of, of religions in human history is just one strand out of a very rich tapestry, which is the history of ideas, the history of 
philosophical ideas and scientific ideas and literary ideas and ideas about ethics and morality. And there's one strand in it, which is the history of religions. And of course, morality, or thinking about moral questions, came very late to religion. Because the early religions were all about taboos and duties to the deity and, and uh, sacrifice and worship and submission and so on. And the idea of the moral life came very late. I'll give you an example. You go home tonight <clears throat> and you uh, have a look at the New Testament and you ask yourself this question. What does the New Testament tell me about how to live? But it tells you two kinds of things. It tells you to be a good Samaritan. It tells you to be kind to widows and orphans. And in that respect, it is the same as any decent moral theory. But it also tells you to give away all your money, everything that you own, to make no plans for tomorrow, consider the lilies of the field, they neither spin nor weave. If your family disagree with you, and they're going to if you give away all your money, then you must turn your back on them. Well, you know, for several centuries in the early history of Christianity, lots of people tried to live that kind of life. They went in, out into the desert as hermits and anchorites and so on. But it isn't a livable ethics. And so what did they do? Well, round about the time, the 4th, 5th, 6th century, you know, 400, 500 years after the beginning of the story, they had to import a great deal of ethics from outside. Where did they get it from? From Greek philosophy, mainly from Stoicism, in order to provide a kind of living philosophical view. They, they imported it at the same time, by the way, that they imported the metaphysics of Greek philosophy because uh, up until that time, Christians thought, as, as the Jewish uh, tradition um, had it before them, that when you die, you're, you sleep in the grave until the last trump, and then the graves open and out you come. St. Paul says that you come out with a, a new body. I like that. I want a suntan and a six-pack and so on. So, <laughs> And he also said that the saints shall not see corruption, that is, that they won't rot in the grave. But when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire in the late fourth century, they started to dig up the saints so they could have their relics in their churches and found to their horror and dismay that all the saints had rotted in the grave and there was nothing left but, but bones. So they had to come up with another story and they imported into Christianity four, 400 years into the story the Platonic doctrine of the immortal soul. So, as you see, religion's always reinventing themselves and so on. But at that point, they also introduced a, a lot of moral considerations, which hadn't really been much part of, of religion beforehand. It had in Judaism, but not in other religions. And that is why now we uh, have been sold a story that morality is very closely allied to religion. In fact, it's a kind of con in a way, because moral and ethical questions really belong to the philosophical tradition. That is why we should be teaching humanism in our schools and not religious studies. Do you, um, do you think humanism is, um, apart from not being taught in schools, do you think it's accessible if you're talking about um, an attitude where you think for yourself and you live a life that you've chosen? Um, how does that uh, apply to people who potentially have barriers in place in their lives that, that don't allow them to live the life they've chosen or who face uh, structural or um, societal sort of um, barriers that mean that, that although there is a life for which they've thought through and they, they want to make conscious choices about, um, aren't able to live the life they've chosen. I mean, how do you make humanism more accessible in that way to those who potentially don't have that privilege? Well, but it's a very good point, of course, because in many societies, uh, there are tremendous barriers to people thinking in ways other than their culture or their religious tradition prescribes for them. It's very hard to do it. For example, in a Muslim community, whether it's in a Muslim majority country or not, there is a tremendous pressure to conform to the, um, the uh, contours of the faith. To be an apostate, for example, can be positively dangerous in, in some Muslim communities. Indeed, to be an apostate in um, a fundamentalist Christian community in the southern states of the uh, United States of America uh, can be very, very painful you can be ostracized, you won't get employment. I mean, there are all sorts of difficulties. I remember um, touring a book in, in America called The God Argument, 
Uh, and actually, I started my tour in Austin in Texas. You might think it was a bit unpropitious state to start touring an atheist book in, but it happens that Austin is to Texas what California is to the United States, and it has lots of lovely music there and so on. And the man who picked me up at the airport was a rather doer character, because I'd said to him, just by way of a joke, I said, it would be tremendously good publicity for my book if somebody shot me. I mean, missed, of course. That would be quite an important part of the deal. And he said in a very humorless way, uh, in Texas, assassination attempts are usually successful. So I thought, well, <laughs> I better not uh, uh, press that one. But, but, the, but there, uh, he told me, and, and indeed one or two other people told me on the tour, that they didn't dare let people know that they were members of the American Atheist Association because they would be ostracized and people would regard them in a very sort of malign way. So even, even in some Christian communities, it can be hard. So I accept your point. But you know, even in those communities, there are people who struggle their way through. They may have to live in a kind of internal exile because they have nobody to share it with, which is why it's so important for people who are a, uh, um, humanists or, or secularists to, to say that they are, because it shows to uh, people who are thinking in, along those lines um, that they have friends, they have companions. And indeed, the atheist movement in the United States is now taking a, a hint from the very, very successful gay movement in the States. I'm an atheist and I'm out and proud, they say, and that has been very liberating for lots of people who felt lost in their communities. Uh, and, th and this um, uh, debate has started to come out in Australia. Um, last year was the 2016 census and there was quite a strong campaign as part of the census taking to nominate um, that you have no religion. Um, back in 2011, I think about 22% of people um, said that they were not religious, um, whereas about 61% of Australians identified with some form of Christianity. Um, and that there was this campaign um, as part of the 2016 census that, you know, even if you've had a religious upbringing but you're no longer practicing, you know, if you're not religious, mark no religion. And that this um, was met with quite a strong backlash, um, you know, and scare campaigns um, from groups who um, were putting forward these views about the consequences if Australia was suddenly not a Christian nation. What would that mean um, for us? Um, and, and so, in terms of that, how do you, you know, in the, the fact that census data is used for public policy? Um, you know, how, how would you um, put forward that, that, that voice to um, inspire people to, to nominate as humanists? I think only 7,000 people at the last census nominated in Australia as, as humanist. But um, they're looking at how you would become you know, uh, more vocal in, your, in, in the fact of making Australia a secular mm. nation. Well, a lot of people tick the Christian box, uh, even if they don't, uh, even if they're atheists indeed, because they think of it as a cultural affiliation, that it, it has this broader s a signification than just what they actually happen to believe. The great majority of people who tick the Christian box are sort of C of E, you know, Chris Christmas and Easter sort of uh, Christians. <laughs> And they also have this wonderful capacity for building Chinese walls between the things that they do rationally in their work, like flying aeroplanes and performing surgical operations, and then on the other side of the Chinese wall, believing that the dead can live again and you, know, you can turn water into, well, you can turn wine into water, of course, but they do, the, do the other way around. And so the, the um, uh, kind of, of uh, permission which is given to people to think in these contradictory and divided ways is, is something we should combat, we should argue against it. So I'm pretty sure that if religion were not taught in schools, if it were left up to you know, individuals, because I think it's, you know, people are perfectly entitled to, to believe what they like, providing they don't harm other people on the basis of it, but uh, if we make a, a sort of public showing of it and give public support to it and public funding, then you have the following anomalous situation. Religious groups are lobby groups, uh, interest groups. They want to, in public policy matters, for example, or in education, they want to put their point of view and to have people accept it. And that is perfectly legitimate. But they're no different in that respect from trades unions or any other NGO or a political party. And they therefore ought to take their turn in the queue with those other organizations. For historical reasons, they are given a place at the head of the queue. They're given a big amplifier. They're given a, a platform 
in which, you know, when there's some moral crisis in society, who gets wheeled out but the local archbishop or bishop or something, as if they knew anything about, you know, moral crises other than causing them. So we have a, we, we, we have a, a, a kind of resetting, rebooting to do in society, which is to say, believe what you like, but take your turn. Now, in the UK, about 10% of the population of England and Wales goes on a regular basis to a church or synagogue or temple or mosque. About, That's about, about 10%. the same here. Yeah. So we have these discussions about secularism in society, and there would always be five men. It's always men, you know, on the top of religions. There'd be a Catholic, a Protestant, a Jew, a, a Muslim, and moi. And I'm there as the token atheist, secularist, humorist, got the hairstyle, didn't ask a lady to come along, so it was all right, fine. And, and I say, you know, look, between them, these four voices speak for about 10% of the population. And my, my voice, I don't know how many it speaks for, but it's certainly a majority in our society who doesn't want to be run by bishops and, and mullahs. And therefore, the secular point of view and of course, secu a secular point of view is perfectly consistent with the religious point of view. Indeed, secularism was invented by the church in the medieval period, wanting to keep the temporal powers off their patch. They wanted to separate church and state because they didn't want the state interfering with them. Of course, they wanted to interfere with the state, but not the other way around. And, and that's been the story ever since then. But the idea of separating the two, of keeping religion more or less to the private sphere, means that um, we have to offer people a view about good, worthwhile lives responsibly lived. And this very simple but very deep, very beautiful humanistic view is a wonderful thing to offer them. For nearly 500 years, or indeed maybe, maybe 500 years before Christianity became the dominant outlook of Europe in the fourth century of the common era, educated people tended to be Stoics. Stoicism has given rise to a use of the term philosophical, which is not quite right, uh, illustrated by the story of the two old ladies on the Glasgow bus, one overheard saying to the other, my dear, you must be philosophical about this, don't give it another thought. Well, that's where it comes out of Stoicism. <coughs> and what the Stoics taught, and the Stoics had this wonderful outlook, they taught with respect to things that you, you can do nothing about, like a tsunami or an earthquake or aging or, you know, um, you, you, must, you must have courage, live with courage. And with respect to things that you can, to some degree, control, your own fears, your own appetites and desires, you should try to achieve some degree of self-mastery. And if you could live with courage to the outward and some, some self-mastery to the inward, you would be living with nobility, with dignity. And that is a wonderful, wonderful idea because anybody who wanted to live in that kind of way, wanted to have the sort of, the, 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 the human nobility that we can achieve if we really thought about it, would at the same time want to be a good neighbor. And that seems to me therefore to be, in, in all its simplicity, a, a very beautiful way of thinking about how to live an ethical life. Are people thinking things through globally? We've seen um, quite a lot of, um, uh, change, uh, political change, um, with the change in the uh, US administration, and of course I know that you're quite uh, vocal on some of the decisions that have been made in the UK recently regarding Brexit. Um, how do you approach this from a humanist perspective if you don't think people are thinking things through? Well, do you know, what's changed recently is not so much the ratio of people who think and don't think in society, and everybody here will be familiar with Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and the way that advertising and political rhetoric and so on can be very um, influential in malignant ways. Um, what has changed, however, is the, uh, the, 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 the fact that computing power now enables people to target messages to very small constituencies of people, thereby aggregating them, so that you can get just enough of a vote. It doesn't have to be a majority, because it certainly wasn't in the Trump case, and it wasn't in the Brexit case either, but just enough to tip a balance to get a very distorted outcome, which doesn't really reflect what people in either of those countries really want. And that is something that we have to be very alert to. Tomorrow, there lands in this country a man who runs a company called Cambridge Analytica. 
he's here to see Mr. Malcolm Turnbull, who no doubt was very impressed by the fact that Cambridge Analytica was a major player in delivering the United States of America to Donald Trump and the Brexit vote in the UK. How they do it is this. They have this um, technique of uh, gathering hundreds of millions of data points about individuals from social media, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and so on. And they can profile people with extraordinary accuracy to such a degree that they could look at just a couple of your tweets or one of your Facebook pages and they could say, well, you're between this age and that age, you probably live in this or that country, you probably vote this way and that way. And they look at word clouds and they see which words occur with most frequency in, among people of that profile. And they're therefore able to target messages very, very precisely to those groups. You will remember Mr. Trump saying in his election campaign, I am Mr. Brexit. Do you remember that? It was because Cambridge Analytica had been brought on board for his campaign. And if you go on YouTube and you listen to a Trump speech, it will sound to you like a lot of you know, BS, a lot of um, non sequiturs. But actually, it's reasonably cleverly worked out because it's a necklace of individual messages, individualized to different target groups. This message, people who are worried about immigration. That message, people who are worried about unemployment. This message, people about health care. And you can even contradict yourself, providing you use different words and, and separate the two messages. So you can get that group on side, and you can get that group on side who think the opposite. And this way, you take lots and lots of little groups and you aggregate them into one group of voters for you. That is what happened in the case of Brexit, and it's what happened in the case of Trump. And th th this technique didn't get majorities in either case. After all, Trump had uh, over three million votes fewer than Hillary Clinton got, but they happened to be the right votes in the right places. In the case of the Brexit vote, there was a restricted franchise because they didn't allow 16, 17 year olds and expats and EU citizens to vote. But even of that restricted franchise, only 37% of the electorate voted to leave. But that was just enough because they managed to get just, just enough of a tipping point for the um, people on the right in politics in Britain to catch the result and run as fast as they could with it to try to take the UK out of the EU. By the way, we are going to try and stop them. Anybody interested to know? Uh, let's have a question from this side of the floor. Great, thank you very much. My name is Meredith Doig. I'm president of the Rationalist Society uh, in Australia. About 10 years ago, I was out and proud as a free thinker, and I had to choose whether to join the Humanist Society or the Rationalist Society. And I chose to join, join the Rationalists because the humanists were a bit soft and fluffy. Um, and your description of humanism was um, very appealing. But, but is there not a problem or is there not an additional challenge to humanists and rationalists and secularists? And that is that we are facing uh, a growing movement from Islam that is really challenging to the sorts of liberal uh, secular values that we sort of take for granted. Um, so what is your, or what should be a humanist, rationalist, secularist uh, response to the challenge of an ideology that does not respect um, friendliness and compassion and tolerance? Um, it's a very good point. Now, uh, I very much hope that my characterization of hum humanism was quite soft and fluffy. You know, the picture of, of the humanist is the bearded, sandal-wearing do-gooder in the community. And that's exactly right. That's just how it should be. Now, I would want every atheist, secularist, rationalist, skeptic, and humanist to be a humanist. Because humanism is the, as it were, ethical background. But we need rationalists because we want people to have good, clear, hard-hitting, uh, edgy arguments to put against people who have 
bizarre views or, or falsely based views or views which are derived from several thousand years ago and don't apply to our time now. We want skeptics who will challenge um, uh, viewpoints that merit being challenged. We want people to um, talk about the metaphysical question of whether or not the universe contains supernatural agencies of one kind or another. That's the theism-atheism debate. We want people to talk about the place of r religious voices in the public policy uh, sphere. So all these different aspects, secularism, rationalism, skepticism, they're all, they're all different um, parts of a, of, of a great federation, if you like, of, of attitudes. But it seems to me that the, the sort of background shared attitude of them all, no matter what they see themselves as doing, is or should be the humanist outlook. Uh, we'll have a question from this side of the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Grayling, for your outstanding leadership and eloquence. Uh, my name is Mark Cherney. I'm a member of a humanistic Jewish congregation here in Melbourne, and uh, it's captured the, very much a lot of energy from young Jewish people who are completely over the religion story and embracing uh, basically atheistic humanism for people who like matzo balls. Um, the, um, one of the things that uh, we're frustrated by, though, by is orthodox rabbis who will get up on a platform and saying, oh no, but orthodox Judaism is a humanistic belief because we have so many rules which try to work on relationships between people. What he doesn't tell you is all that nasty stuff. But so my question is, how do we deal with orthodox religions that want to try to own the word humanism? Yeah, I should uh, just get really fully involved in the tug of war over ownership of that word uh, in, in pretty well the way that you've just done now. Um, I'm very familiar with this m move on the part of people who say, but uh, this faith or that faith is or has a great humanistic uh, uh, at aspect to it. Um, and, and I think we, we want to say, uh, you know, in the great Babel of isms, we need some clarity about what we mean by the commitment we make when we apply this label to ourselves. So, uh, so you know, there's always a war over words, but uh, if we insist on a capital H sense of, of humanism as distinctively identifying a particular stance to the world of an ethical kind, which makes no use of or it doesn't invoke any religious tradition, then I think eventually we will be able to patent it for ourselves. Let's stick on this side with a, a, another question. Uh, my name's Julian Burnside. In Australia in recent years, it's been impossible to go to any public event which isn't preceded by an acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the country we meet on. The details vary from place to place. What do you think of the ethics of that acknowledgement, which is not accompanied by an acknowledgement that our forebears took the land from them and that we don't plan to give it back to them? I think it's a bit sneaky of you to drag me into Australian... Um, <laughs> Uh, but I take your point, and I think it sounds like a good one. Hello. Um, this might be a bit deep for a Q&A, but um, I'm just wondering where you stand on uh, free will, determinism, compatibilism. And I tie that into um, humanism because it's a strong undercurrent in society that, that people are morally culpable, uh, punishment, justice, desert, all those things. And I've, um, I've heard a lot of arguments on both sides, in particular Dan Dennett, I think, is, uh, who you no doubt know, is a sort of a figurehead for compatibilism at the moment um, in the face of probably most other people being fairly deterministic. Um, so I'm just wondering where you stand on, on that uh, issue in the sense that you can't hold people morally responsible in a deterministic universe or, or world. Um, well, you're, you're right. They hadn't uh, organized breakfast for tomorrow morning, so we don't have time to explore this properly, I'm afraid. This is the deepest and hardest question in metaphysics, really. How how one makes sense of the fact that seeing ourselves as part of the causal realm of nature on the one hand, which Im implies or entails some form, stricter or less strict, of determinism. And on the other hand, the way we picture ourselves as uh, moral beings, 
who can be praised or blamed for what we do, held accountable for what we do, take responsibility for what we do. If uh, any form of determinism which is um, worth its salt were true, then the question that you've just asked me was written in the stars millions of years ago. So it, it is a problem, this one. And the short answer I can give you is, is this. You may remember Karl Popper's point about a theory which is consistent with everything. You know, his, his argument was that unless a good uh, uh, scientific hypothesis can specify what would refute it, the hypothesis is empty. Well, there is a problem with the deterministic thesis, which is that it's consistent with everything. If I say, I feel free, or we have to have a... You know, the determinist will say, well, you're determined to feel that way, or you're determined to take that view of human nature and human choice. Um, and that should be worrying for the determinist, because there doesn't seem to be anything that would count as a counterexample, and would look, therefore, if it falls foul of Popper. I think it may, may be what I'm hoping, and I'm even prepared to put a, an Aussie dollar or two on uh, our being able to find out something about the way uh, our extremely complex uh, uh, neural onboard equipment um, can operate you know, feedback loops and self-monitoring loops and so on, which introduce novelty into causal chains, into decision processes. I don't, don't have available, because nobody does so far, a mechanism for doing so. But given the deep importance of um, the idea of there being genuine possibilities of choice, uh, otherwise the moral life is an empty notion in itself, that something like the idea of autonomy, given all the social constraints that uh, limit it as well, but some concept of autonomy has to be available to us so that we can think as we do. We've probably got time for one last question on this side. Um, do you think there's a humanist version of politics? And I mean that less in terms of the outcomes, which is often about public good, but in its conduct, which is often a oppositional competition for power. Um, and do you think that's more inclined towards a progressive or even the left? Well, I, I, yeah, the answer is yes to both those uh, questions. Um, I, I do. I mean, I do think that, that you know, Aristotle uh, recognized the very intimate connection between ethics and politics, uh, and quite explicitly so in saying, after the Nicomachean ethics, you move into the politics and talk about the kinds of structures that a society, the polis, ought to have to make it possible for people to live the eudaimonic life. So uh, uh, politics and ethics are, are very intimately connected. And if you, if you wanted best choice of ethical outlook for a, a political domain, it would surely be the humanist one. Um, there I need to open a footnote and point out that Dan Dennett just mentioned a moment ago would always say to, to students that the word surely marks the weakest point in any argument, so I better withdraw it. <laughs> but it, it would be a, a very good deal better, I would think, for a, a political debate to be one which is premised on some version of secularism, some version of humanism, than one that was partisan to a particular religious or moral or metaphysical outlook. So I absolutely agree. Now, the great problem with politics, of course, is that all political careers end in failure unless the politician in question, like a poet, dies early enough. And the reason for this is that um, po politics is a matter of trying to effect compromises between competing interest groups. So a politician, the longer a politician stays in office, the more interest groups he's going to make fed up until eventually they're all fed up, which is why uh, the, his career will end, or her career will end in, in disaster. This is because the society is an arena of negotiation with itself about how it comports itself and what it can do. And um, in the dilemmas of uh, politics, just as in the dilemmas of ethics, you can't ever get a solution, or very, very rarely can you get a solution without residue because compromises don't make everybody happy. There are always going to be people who are a bit resentful or had to give up too much. And so the nature, the, the kind of soiled nature of the political domain is, is one where we're all going to feel a bit uncomfortable in the end. And that is why a sympathetic and generous view of our fellows in that domain would be a, a healthy and helpful thing. 
This is a fascinating uh, discussion, one which I hope you will all um, continue um, with yourselves and, and with others as, uh, as, as we uh, strive to be out and proud about our humanism and our humanistic tendencies. I'd just very much like to thank Professor Grayling uh, for sharing with us this evening. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.